does. Okay, now we're recording. This is the April May meeting of the W3C Web RTC Working Group. Welcome everybody. Just a reminder of the IPR policy, we abide by the patent policy and it means that only people and companies listed on the link are allowed to make substantive contributions to the WebRTC specs. So today we're gonna to talk about new work. Uh, Harold has a presentation on insertable streams and Sam will talk about speech recognition and then we're gonna uh, work on the usual privacy and security issues. So a little bit about the meeting. If you're here, you probably have the meeting info. Uh, we have a link to the slides up on the wiki. Do we have a scribe? Someone just, you all you have to do is take notes on what we're deciding here. Hi, okay, buddy. Ah, oh, thank you, Henrik. Okay, uh, there's an IRC channel to do that in. Uh, we are recording this meeting right now and there's a link to all the drafts in case want to get more info. So here's what's on the agenda today. Uh, Harold will talk a little bit about insertable streams. As I mentioned, Sam will talk about a, an extension to content hints. Um, then we'll have uh, several issues on media capture and media capture output. That'll be the rest of the meeting. All right, Harold, over okay. to you. So the insertable streams is a project that we started in order to address some of the use cases from Web, WebRTC NV. Uh, the particular shape of the, of the first version was given by needs at Google. But uh, the point of the insertable streams model is that we should be able to give JavaScript more power over what uh, over what actually goes on the wire. Next slide. Just a reminder of how RTC media, RTC, WebRTC works. The basic idea of WebRTC is that you get a control surface. You get a pay connection, you get get user media, you get uh, media, media stream tracks, which are not streams. They're basically a control surface uh, to say how the media flows. And the whole flow of media is inside the browser. Next slide. So the way we did insertable streams is that we give the an insertion point in the processing chain, the one that's uh, outlined in vertical in in red, red in vertical here, where we say, okay, here we have a unit of work. We chose to focus on the encoded frame or encoded buffer of, of samples in case of audio and say, okay, now it's going out towards the wire. You have the chance to look at it, manipulate it, do something with it and then have it sent over the wire. And similarly, on the incoming side, you get what came across the wire in, and, and was shaped like a frame and get to say, uh, here's what you do. Uh, Florent, can you take care of admitting people? Of course. Great. So, Post encode, pre decode was the path we implemented. We can do, can do exactly the same thing with raw data. And uh, that's an obvious next step and would uh, help with a lot of the use cases that were on the previous slide. But uh, this is the first one. Next slide. So, what we have is in Chrome Canary. It's been tested with applications. I mean, do a web group calling where, where we have this pre-existing end-to-end -end crypto solution where that we just want the web client to. <coughs> we have the JIT meet. 
linked article that uh, actually came out first with something that people can try with encoding. The picture to the right is uh, uh, is made by a slightly bizarre co form of uh, cryptography called uh, just XOR with a key and leave something in the clear so that the pictures are prettier. Normally with everything would just turn black when you encrypt it because the because the the decoder just says, oh, I don't understand any of this and be right. But uh, it was a fun demo. And uh, Medus actually did a demo based on, based, on, based on the same API where they could use the ability to attach more data to a frame to say, okay, here's some information that's interesting in for, for AR, uh, augmented reality applications, effects that you want to apply at the receiver, but where the sender is the, is the easiest place to figure out what needs to be done. And performance seems to be adequate for those purposes. It's not the insertable streams that is the bottleneck, which I was very happy to see. If you look at the next slides, uh, the API is really simple. When you create a pair connection, you say, I'm going to use insertable streams on the encoding, on the audio and the video. And when you create a sender or a receiver for whatever reason, you get API there to say, here's the processing I want, want. here's the, give me the streams that uh, contain the frames. So that's uh, perfectly ordinary. Uh, stream in the WG sense, where you get the sequence of objects that you can consume and manipulate. And uh, to the lower right, you see the form of an encoded video frame, which is what we pass across these interfaces. It's got a type, it's got a timestamp, it's got a data. And we got what's still the most open part of it, which is additional data, which is things you need to know about the frame in order to do the right thing. And we're not sure what that has to be yet, but we know that there has to be something there. Next slide. So this is the core of the demo that you can see on, uh, on WebRTC samples. It says, okay, you create the transform stream, you connect it to the, to the encoded video streams that you get from an encoder. And therefore, what, you, what comes from the encoder will be sent through that transformation function before it goes out to the packetizer and goes out, out on the network. It's actually that simple. So next slide. It becomes very interesting when you do workers because this is another new feature called transferable streams, which is you're able to take the stream that comes out of the encoder and pass it to a worker. And then the platform will actually send the frames to the worker through that stream and your main thread JavaScript doesn't have to see it or touch it. This actually has two good features. One is performance. The other one is that it's a very easy separation of concerns because you can then say that all the transformation stuff and all the setup you need to do the transformation stuff, that can be done on a worker. 
And you can imagine that the worker could be something that you pick up as a component from someone else. Or you could even say that this worker actually is actually conforming to a standard and uh, just give a URL given in the standard instead of giving a real URL. And you'll get an implementation that conforms to the spec. But you have the example code, you can do it right now. Next slide. So this is definitely an experiment. You can sign up for an original trial or just turn, up, turn on the experimental features in your browser if you have Chrome 83, which is currently in beta. We're working to synchronize with the way Web Codex defines frames so that we have these two ways of addressing these things actually being handled in the same way. We want to look at how we can extend the same concept to raw media, where buffer handling is obviously more of a problem. After all, the data size is like 10 to 100 times bigger. And then we want to propose the API for standardization. So I have on my to-do list to actually write up the API we have in, the, in specification form and propose that for adoption. And I hope to have it out in May. And then we'll come to the working group and say, can we adopt this as a working group document? This is an experimental API. And it means that it will change. And we want it to change because we want it to be the right thing. But uh, I think it's the interest shown already shows that it's something that its time has come. And the fact that we're, at, we're able to implement it shows that it's a viable means of doing this. And with that, I'll say questions, comments. So, um, yeah, so I'm a little, um... First, I had a question about the uh, use case N19. It says the application must be able to insert processed frames into the outgoing media path. Uh, does processed frames mean uh, access to raw media or access to encoded media? Because this API, just to be clear, only exposes encoded frames, right? Yes. There's no access to raw data. Yes, that's right. So, so is that N19? That's N19. OK. Um, the, the, yeah. it, it's really, this is, this is the first IPI. It's, it's the one that we are pretty sure we could get it, get done. And then we, uh, we do expect to have a, the raw API on, on, the, right. on the path. So I see, I, th I think I see two problems. One is, uh, I think Mozilla is still forming an opinion uh, on a position on the spec uh, as far as it being used for end-to-end -end encryption. So I expect that'll be forthcoming. Um, I think we have some concerns whether this is um, true end-to-end -end encryption or if it's a sort of poor man's version, since there's no key management. Um, and I believe that in its current shape, that's the only thing. Well, it can be used for that, and it can also be used. I, I don't think you covered it, but it can be used to synchronize data. With... Yeah, that, that's N23. OK, yes, right. Um, so, but the other cases, funny has uh, an access to raw frames. Do you imagine? Do you imagine that being on the sender or on a different object? I imagine that being on the sender, because uh, in the current uh, model, the sender actually contains uh, or wraps the encoder and the dec or and the the receiver. Mm wraps the encoder decoder so that uh, if we if we don't break open these objects then uh, the sender and receiver are the objects that okay that, that this api belongs to so i think my main concern with that is that the that seems to require a peer connection then in order to do things like funny hats which seems like you should be able to do locally without ever sending it to anyone yep 
and uh, then maybe uh, putting that on an object like a track might be more logical. And uh, but going but going with that train of thought, once it's on the track and it applies both to audio and video, at some point I would question: uh, Does it still belong in this in the WebRTC or Media Capture specs, or is it a more general access? Um, API at this point, and is there overlap with audio worklets, which also uh, is the currently the de facto way to do uh, audio processing? Yep. So uh, taking audio worklets first. Audio worklets is a particular um, way of looking at media. It's uh, got its own special synchronization properties and its own special um, requirements for synchronicity, which are applicable for some ap applications and uh, really painful for others. Uh, so, I, so I think that's different tools for different purposes. I thought about exploding this off, off into the track, but I think of that as opening up the, the sender and receiver objects and seeing the pieces inside. And I think that's a larger design effort. So uh, the nice thing about this one, and the, the thing that makes me somewhat confident in proposing this, even for end-to-end -end encryption, even if the key management isn't in a safe place yet, is that it turned out to be deployable. So it doesn't prevent us from getting where we want to go. So I think uh, that eventually the, we will explode the, the sender and receiver objects to say that they are, actually this is a chain of objects with connections between them. Actually, the. There are, there are things that go in both directions inside the object, which make it, makes it more complex than a, than a stream graph. But uh, I think that's uh, something that we have to do, do carefully. Insertable streams turned out to be relatively easy to specify and relatively easy to implement based on current. Current current code bases. Would you say that the uh, tie to RTP, like uh, the timestamps, uh, makes this different than if it was on the on the tracks? I wouldn't like to have. Uh, well, I'm not sure if I want uh, RTP timestamps on track or not. It's. Uh, Something that we've so far we've kept RTP timestamps inside WebRTC, and uh, the the few places where we actually have exposed RTP timestamps or things that are generated from the RTP timestamps, we have uh, tied them to web to peer connection interfaces, but. Uh, the whole thing about time and uh, tracks is iffy. I don't have good solutions. What hey, is Harold. This is Max from Microsoft. Uh, first of all, I guess, great work. This is a very awesome feature. I think everyone was looking for that. So thank you there. And I guess you folks managed to implement it as well very fast, which is awesome to see. But here's the question, right? I guess you also highlighted that uh, one of the major questions here is performance or was performance. And here you mentioned that some measurements happened and performance is adequate, right? Given the current implementation, of course. So can you be a bit more specific what this adequate means, right? And I'm specifically wondering what kind of end-to-end -end delay extra we're looking into here. Well, uh, it's it's probably a, a bit of a stretch to say that we have done measurements. What we have actually done is to is to put up a put up a pair connection with uh, this stuff in it, 
wave our hands and say, see that uh, it does not break up and it does not uh, look horribly slow. So measuring how many milliseconds of the extra delay we incur is something that's definitely on, on the list of things we have to do. Guido, do we have any, anything else that we that I, I've, I've forgotten? Uh, no, no. No. Ah. The only well, the best way to put it is that so far in the things where it has been tested, it hasn't been the bottleneck. But uh, we we don't have measurements, um, different scenarios about the specific delays introduced by by this. Uh, what was the, what was the bottleneck? Do you think? Uh, well, in the things where it has been used so far it has been uh, doing all the uh, for end-to-end -end encryption it has been all, all the all the operations to actually do the encryption and yeah dealing with with uh, how to efficiently deal with the frames to try to reduce frame copies in the internal system we have to, right. to, to do that. That, that those have been those have been the main performance issues we have seen so far um, this is this is when I, I share the same concerns as max um currently we have a pipeline that has uh one observable point which is the entry of the encoder and the output of the decoder which makes it uh very easy or very flexible in the way you can uh, optimize it <laughs> for instance you could think that uh if you're doing end-to-end -end encryption and you have keys, you do not want these keys in the web process, in the process that is running JavaScript. So you would like to do that in, in a separate process. Same thing for encoders and decoders that might get access to hardware. So you might want to protect them as well and put that in a in separate process. And if you look at network, it's the same. So if you look at the graph there, you might want to transport network adaptation encode uh, in a process that is not running JavaScript. So you use peer connection API to modify it, but you do not run it in uh, the process that is running JavaScript. On the other hand, the display, the preprocessing, and so on is really tied to the application. So there it's fine to, to put it uh, in JavaScript. So adding one entry point in, in this block there is uh, we need to be very cautious there. Um, it might have significant perf issues if we want to go to a, a very uh, split process architecture. Um, and if we're looking at the applications, uh, the scenarios, the scenarios, one scenario is end-to-end -end encryption, right? And I hope that 99% of all applications that are doing uh, video conferencing will do end-to-end -end encryption in the future, uh, which means that at least in the foreseeable future, they might add an entry point there uh, and run JavaScript there. So um, I, I think that we, we really want like, to be sure that there's no perf loss, uh, at least. And um, I think that we want to be in a world where maybe temporarily it's fine to have uh, an entry point there. But in, future, in the future, for things that are really important, like end-to-end -end encryption, we actually want that to be uh, implementable by the browser and setable by the JavaScript application. Yeah. So this uh, proposal makes me worry if we are just stopping at, oh, yeah, we, uh, we expose the API now. End-to-end uh, -end encryption is implemented in JavaScript, and that's good enough. And I don't think it's good enough. And I don't want to stay just in the middle of the bridge. I want to go to a world where we have an end-to-end -end encryption spec, uh, but it's standardized and every browser is implementing it. And uh, applications just have to say, hey, I want to use end-to-end -end encryption. And there is my way of handling keys. And yeah. key management so, is very difficult. Uh, so it should be left to the application somehow, that's fine. But uh, the specific bits of S-Frame, which um, keys to use, which crypto to use, and so on. I would prefer that to be left to the browser at the end of the day. Just like uh, currently for DTLS, we're saying 
that crypto is no, not good enough anymore. So we want to obsolete it. And I want browser to still have this ability there saying, oh, for end-to-end -end encryption, we no longer want that crypto. It's not good. Yeah. And if we do that in JavaScript, my fear is that we will not get there. We, we, we will lose that power to uh, web developers. And we know that web developers, when they have the power, uh, they will probably not update, except if they have a really important incentive. That's, a, that's what we are seeing from DTLS as deprecation, for instance. Um, so I'm, yeah, that's my feedback there. So, so uh, uh, my kind of response is that we spent five years trying to define uh, a protocol for end-to-end -end encryption in Perk. Uh, it's totally failed to gain traction. And it's totally failed to fail to be deployable. Uh, for this particular version of end-to-end uh, -end encryption, we actually managed to deploy it. And uh, if the structure is right, it's possible, and we get consensus on the component that is able to do the key management and the encryption, then it's possible to use this architecture to invoke such a component. But uh, waiting until we have the architecture, I'm afraid we'll, get, we'll leave us the users exposed for another five years. So uh, mm. I had a question about the synchronization with Web Codex, Harold. So in Web Codex, we've been looking at a couple of things that are maybe slightly different. I don't know. Instead of an array buffer, we've been talking about potentially like a handle to a to GPU buffer, um, which is probably more useful for the uh, raw video case. I can't think of a use for the um, encoded video case. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other is, for reasons I don't completely understand or agree with, Web Codex is not going to use streams. <laughs> um, so I wondered if you had a comment on that. Oh, I don't. I think I, I've read the documents where Web Codex argue that streams are the wrong thing for them. Um, they have a few points. In the if you go back to the, I'll go down two slides. Uh, uh, no, the other way. Yeah, the other way. Yeah. Uh, let me see. I want slide eight. Slide eight. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that one. Uh, so you'll notice that there are, in particular, on the encode side, there are arrows going from. In this drawing left to right, where the main flow is right to left. So those feedback loops are basically don't fit well with well with the uh, with the streams model. In, uh, in the insertable streams case, we can get away with it, at least to some degree, because uh, we just let uh, those feedback signals uh, pass the uh, the insertable stream step and go straight from network adaptation and back to the encoder. So how does it work for bandwidth, for instance? Let's say network adaptation is saying, oh, encoder, please use one megabyte, or please use that bitrate. And then the JavaScript is inserting like uh, a significant amount of data there. What, what will happen? Something will blow up. It's one of, our, mm. one of the unsolved problems in this interface. Yep. Mm. So I imagine that as, I mean, this is something that the way, the way Web Codex structured their idea, they have to solve it. Right. Because there is no hidden path. It, in this case, we can say, oh, as long as you don't violently break the contract, it will sort of work out okay. So 
we can get away with not solving the problem in the first instance. But it's one of the things that I've been scratching my head about how to how how to do right. I imagine that uh, we might have to expose a stream of feedback signals that the web application can also insert itself into. But uh, we don't have the even the sketch of that one yet. Are there things that we could be doing, Harold, based on the existing experimental trial to try to get at some of the performance issues? Like I thought of maybe a demo that tried to simulate the CPU of some of the raw video uh, use cases, like the funny hats, um, just to see. I mean, one, one concern I had is that the crypto demos are in some sense easier because they're more likely to have cache hits um, than like a machine learning kind of a thing, which could take you know, data from all over the frame. Um, just wondering how we can use this trial to try to get more more ideas on the performance side. So one of my first thoughts was that I should uh, at least place instrumentation in the demo. Mm. So that I can be able to say that, uh, OK, this, uh, this, fr th this frame arrived at the, the, at, at the receiver. And milliseconds after the after it uh, departed from the sender. So uh, there are a few very simple steps you can take mm. in order to get measurements. And uh, if we can uh, get those steps uh, actually re contained in the in the test fixture and and run as uh, as benchmarks, we can actually run them across multiple platforms. Mm -hmm. and, see, and see see whether there are platforms that where things are more problematic than others. But yeah, we haven't gotten that far yet. I have a question related to uh, scenarios. So there's one scenario, which is end-to-end -end encryption. And the other one is uh, basically a funny hat, like the metadata. And uh, I was wondering, um, so currently, we have these two scenarios, and we are trying to design an API that uh, fits both. And I was wondering whether uh, these two scenarios actually, are really. There's three. There's funny hats, machine learning, and virtual reality gaming. Uh, OK. Yeah, I guess f funny hats is done before the encoder somehow, right? Right, right. As so, same with machine learning, probably, yeah. Yeah, so somehow this API proposal is really about like uh, metadata that you want to put as part of the encoded frames and also end-to-end -end encryption. Um, so for instance, in end-to-end -end encryption, probably you will not uh, enlarge the size of the frames of the encoded frames. So there's, there's no issue about uh, the bandwidth. But you uh, might, but for, depending on the scheme. Yeah, you, you might still, but hopefully you can control hopefully not, that. Hopefully not, not a so huge amount. That, yeah, yeah. So it seems that Maybe maybe it's good to have one API uh, that supports both scenarios, or maybe it's we should just acknowledge that these are two different scenarios with two different requirements, and maybe two APIs will will be better at the end yeah. of the day. So, for this scenario, what would be the problem of actually allowing or enabling this transformation layer to uh, tell the sender how much bandwidth it would like to allocate to itself? extra right to what the encoder produces. We just have to add, add an API for it. Yeah, yeah, but wouldn't it serve then all those three scenarios, right? If you encrypt without any introducing any extra, right, it would just work. But then if you add an extra, like a metadata, you just configure, uh, well, the sender accordingly, and that's it. Hmm. So yeah, for, for the and, uh, we can, ex for the so we can expose that. For the very simple case, like uh, the current demo of end-to-end -end encryption where you add five bytes, uh, and then we could just uh, have a configuration field that says, uh, says five. And for more complex cases, you might have to do other things. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, we have to extend the interface to do it. 
just to note that we are beyond a third of the call, so just uh, yeah. So we'll. I think we probably have to move off of this if that's okay for everybody. Yeah. But thank you, Harold. Yep, and thanks for thanks for the comments. Thank we'll return. Okay, so uh, Sam, you are you have the floor. Hello. Um, yeah, so this is an update from last month. Uh, I talked about speech recognition and how, uh, as it stands today, it's hard to differentiate between uh, tracks for speech recognition and communication. And so um, we found that the MST content hint only contains a speech, uh, which seems to be slightly geared towards communication. Uh, especially because it provides defaults for uh, things like noise cancellation. Um, and so there are some extra slides uh, in the deck that are from last month that describe kind of the differences uh, between use cases for communication and for recognition and why uh, communications modifications generally hurt spe speech recognition and vice versa. Um, so next slide. Uh, so our proposal are, was to add a new content in uh, for audio tracks uh, called speech recognition. Um, this will allow developers to say what their tracks is going to be used for. Uh, it also allows for the platform to make uh, changes based on that flag. Um, and so the pros here are that this is a kind of a minimal amount of changes. Uh, it's only adding a content hint, um, and it only really modifies that draft, although it will have some defaults for what we set different constraints to. Um, and this will allow uh, for prototyping and gathering feedback from developers um, in the sense of like an origin trial uh, for Chromium. Uh, the cons are that I believe content hint is not used by all browsers right now. Uh, so I guess I'm trying to get uh, feedback on what you guys think of this proposal. Um, and yeah. So my initial reaction is that um, it doesn't really fit well with content hint, does it? Um, I mean, content hint was supposed to describe, just on a just a very basic sense, what is this content? Here's a hint for what it is. It's descriptive of the content. And here, speech rec we already have speech. So why wouldn't a developer use speech? Why would they use speech recognition? That seems to have more to do with what the end purpose is going to be. So I don't know if that's just a bike shed problem of getting a different name, or if there's a more underlying problem. Like, and I know you tried to put it as a constraint before. Um, yeah, it's hard to wrap my my head around the the best API for this, I guess. Uh, do you want to show the hidden slides, Sam? Or uh, sure. Yeah, I'm just wondering how to, how to unhide him for a second. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Should be visible now. Oh, yeah. OK. So yeah, cool. Uh, let me go back to view. Yeah, so maybe there's like a world where, um, so maybe speech is something more like communication, and then speech recognition is maybe something more like dictation. Um, that could help differentiate between, like the use case is specifically, um, this is going to be listened to by another human being, and uh, this is going to be recognized by some kind of model. Yeah, so this table comes from an Etsy spec, is that right, Sam? Yeah. 
do you want access to the raw stream or do you want some processing but less aggressive processing than in the speech case um we want basically in terms of the um constraints as they exist today we don't want those constraints and then so we also want to pass this flag um across like the platform so down into the operating system layer as well so the last part go ahead are you planning to also um, provide that uh, field to encoders for instance so that they would do something specific related to speech recognition um or is it or is it like not meaningful for encoders for encoders i don't think it would be meaningful well some things like the comfort the undesirability of comfort noise might affect an opus setting right i guess that one might have Does that make sense, Yuen? Um, yeah, I mean, if if um, content hints usually they can go both both uh, directions, right? Uh, yeah. So if if the encoder can be tuned like we try to tune for uh, uh, synthetic images, the video encoders, then uh, it seems content hint might be a good fit. Actually, on browser support, it seems that all of the browsers support content hints, but Firefox only on audio and, and Safari only on video. Um, That's according to w, w, WPT.FYI. For content hint? OK. That's surprising. Well, uh, what that means, right, is you're just setting and retrieving the content hint doesn't mean that it's doing is that is that what the test is doing yeah okay i do not believe we support that but i could be wrong well we're ju you're just, just passing a test by accident that's very possible right <laughs> so if we were to maybe change um speech to like communication and this one to dictation would that make it clearer or not i thought the name was fine i mean the uh, once we accepted that it's uh, content and then uh, uh, discussing the name is mostly back shot. right 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 that's back shot. gotcha so so just so i understand uh it Right now, you can turn off all the audio constraints that are in the spec anyway uh, by setting them to false explicitly. So it, since you can already do that, what is missing that you cannot do? Well, I guess there's a bunch of things on the table that aren't covered by all of those, right? So the problem yeah. is that browsers are doing process other processing that we haven't standardized? Yeah. Is that yeah. right? So, yeah. Yeah. So if we were to standardize those, or if we added some kind of raw constraint and figured out the conflicts with that, so would it, is there, you mentioned something about hints to other, uh, other lower level parts that I wasn't, it was a little fuzzy to me, if you could clarify. Yeah, so there's a lot of optim, like there's, so in a lot of, like modern machines, there's a lot of optimization that goes all the way through to the hardware. And so um, for those machines right now on the web, uh, there's nothing that you can kind of specify uh, that would kind of make it down to that layer to allow the machine to, uh, like for example, um, like, Let's say you're on a machine with optimizations for speech recognition. A lot of times that involves kind of like, you know, beamforming or like moving uh, 
like speakers so that they can kind of recognize where someone is and adjust um, the direction. Uh, but in order to get that to happen, you have to specify that you want um, to do speech recognition. And so this is kind of allowing for that to happen if the implementer wants to do that. Um, and then other than that, the other kind of optimizations that happen are along the lines of what's listed here, um, but they haven't been necessarily uh, like standardized across platforms. Um, what what do you think the next steps are, Harold? Do you, are we asking the group to review the PR, comment on it? So uh, next step is uh, so so the we ha we have a PR right, and uh, so next step is either to merge the PR or not. And if the group says that we have consensus to, uh, if if the group says that uh, it's okay to merge, then we merge it. And then we we'll see if uh, if we can get the implementations enough when that that time rolls around. If the group says that this uh, comes to consensus that this is a bad idea, then uh, that, that, then we have to drop it. Just a flag. I think I think it looks okay now. I think we should merge it. Yeah. Yeah. Would it help to like get an implementation uh, and kind of like test it or? Yep, an implementation yep. would definitely help. And, yep. and see what processing it's enabling and disabling and this kind of stuff. Uh, that would really help. OK. But And so do you think that would be necessary in terms of next steps uh, for merging this? I, I would merge it first. I would then, merge uh, it first, yeah. OK. Cool. And, then, and then say that. Uh, Let's get an implementation so you can figure out if, uh, if the spec is complete then. OK. Cool. So uh, I don't know. It still seems like, did, did we have a, I know there was an earlier proposal. Uh, did we consider having a speech recognition constraint? Oh, yes. We did. did oh, just, yes. We did yeah. that at the last meeting. But it, but it was a, but it was a, um, a Boolean, right? So that might conflict well, with the others. I think, if I recall correctly, I think the the pushback on the the last time this was uh, presented was that it was vague what it was doing because it was um, this catch-all thing, and I think this content hint is the same. It's just placed in this content hint, which sounds more appropriate. But regardless where this merges, I, I, my question would be like, is, do we have a well-defined list of what it's supposed to do? Or is it up to the implementation to figure that out? Well, there are Etsy specs that describe kind of what it's supposed to do, right, Sam? Yeah, so the specs do help in describing like what is exactly the difference between uh, the two different types. And so whether or not like ideally things should go according to the Etsy spec, but I, in terms of how implementation, I think like part of it is if there was an implementation, it would be helpful um, to see exactly what's going on. But the specs do define what the difference between communication and speech um, okay. should be. Well, that, that, that's good. I mean, we could merge and iterate. Uh... As long as there's uh, you know, some reference to to what it's supposed to do. Just just a question, another question, Sam. Uh, uh, Alexa actually they implemented this with WebRTC, right? Is that true? And there is that what the acoustic testing is? Because Alexa is based on WebRTC. Um, yeah. So the testing um, was done in conjunction with like Amazon um, and Alexa. 
So as, as far as I know, um, they did use WebRTC and um, they've worked with, uh, they, they worked on the spec as well. I know, I kind of like dictation, but am I the only one? I mean, it, it is a draft, so it like can be updated. updated so I, I prefer speech recognition, Justin. Yeah. Um, anyway, I think we probably have exhausted the time that we have available to this. Uh, and I think we have rough next steps. Are you happy, Sam? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the feedback here. Uh, in terms of, so I don't actually have right permission to be um, MSD you don't, content. You don't, you don't get the right permission to make a pull request. You just okay. kill the repo and, and create, create a branch in your own repo. And then, and then it says PR40 on the top. Is it yeah, the, the PR is there. The PR is there, yeah. No problem. Hmm. We'll, uh, we'll do a re uh, the editors will, that's me. We'll re do a review of the actual text and then uh, either merge it or ask for text updates. Okay, cool. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we're on to the privacy and security part of the agenda. Uh, Jan Ivar. All right, so I'm going to start out with a quiz. This is a, a time warp quiz back to 2014 or 2018. And the question is the device change event fires when? And for people who haven't looked ahead on the slides, they can guess. Uh, the user inserts or removes a device, that's A. Or B, the enumerate devices list changes. Or C, those are the same thing. And uh, anyone want to guess? I guess everyone's looked ahead. So you can go to the next slide. And the answer is those are the same thing. And uh, so there's at the bottom, I have two users, the one on the left, is basically looking for an end user to insert a device. And in their app, they have a communications app where they want to, as an app choice, switch to any device the user inserts on the on the thinking that they probably want to use that device. On the other, on the right hand side, there's another different user caching the enumerate devices list. They have their own cache for certain reasons. I'm not sure why. Uh, next slide. Unfortunately, in 2020, C is no longer the correct results because get use media may now change the list. And so that makes the two users sad because the user on the left does not now know now whether the user inserted a device or not. Because uh, before get user media, you now have one audio, one camera and one microphone without device IDs, or you have zero, I believe. Um, so when they call get user media, if they were to call, um, enumerate devices again, we're now saying that um, and some browsers now are firing a device change event because the now the list now is populated with more things. <clears throat> um, but the user doesn't know whether uh, anything was inserted or not. So it, they can't take it as a strong signal that the user probably wants to use this device because they just inserted it. And the guy on the right, uh, he's wondering, well, is my cache stale or not now? <clears throat> so next slide. So sad customers there. So this is just a recap of <clears throat> how um, JavaScript and the old spec might have detected new devices. And it's basically by doing a simple sub subtract, you call enumerate devices first, <clears throat> and then you listen for the device change event. You call enumerate devices again. You do a subtract uh, using device ID, any devices that are new. And the two, um, the two use cases for this is basically before uh, initial get user media, before you have permission, <clears throat> uh, the user may have no devices, and they might, uh, which means you're not supposed to show them a feature. Like if they don't have camera, don't show them the you know the funny or the the camera button, and they insert a device, and suddenly they're not qualified for the feature. <clears throat> Excuse me. And after gum, uh, it may be during a call, a user inserts a preferred device over the one they have now. Um, and this is kind of broken because um, we no longer have device IDs pre-GUM. <clears throat> so there are cases uh, on the issue where uh, if you were to just look at device IDs uh, after GUM, you, it would 
you might just have a single camera, but before GUM, it had no device ID, and after GUM, it has a device ID. So the algorithm above will say that now there's a new device. So that's not great. So there's no right way around that apps doing device detection will are, are broken and will have to update. And the, the basically, what <clears throat> the minimum they'll have to do is probably call enumerate devices again right after GUM success to update their cache list. Otherwise, they're going to suffer false positives. Next slide. So let's see what the spec says today. Uh, device change says that uh, the device the device should fire the event should fire when the set of media devices available to the user agent has changed. Uh, and interestingly, it does not say to the available to the application. It says available to the user agent, meaning mm -hmm. <clears throat> something in the system got inserted, things like that. But then it also says elsewhere when new media input and or output devices are made available, which is passive language that's hard to read into. Is it made available by the user agent itself or is it made available from the OS to the user agent? So again, the use case uh, that I claim is important to support is uh, inserting a device as a strong signal that they want to use it. <clears throat> so now we have problems where uh, if you now fire a device change uh, whenever the gum list changes, uh, that this can be indistinguishable from a user inserting a device at that very time. So you have a race we get using media and inserting a device. <clears throat> As a web developer, I cannot determine whether this is a new device. So it, let's say I follow the algorithm, I figure out it's a new device that wasn't there before, <clears throat> as far as I know. But, and I, uh, you know, I don't know whether that's uh, actually happened because the user did something or whether that's an artifact of our new model. So I don't know if I should switch to it immediately. And if they didn't insert anything, I don't want to accidentally be switching to a secondary device because they just joined the call with their primary. Next slide. So <clears throat> I don't see a way around this other than trying to, this, this single event in 2018 cannot, can no longer support both those users. <clears throat> so. Uh, the only the changes uh, and also apps will still need to update to call enumerate devices after get user media anyway, or this is not going or they're going to get false positives. So I have proposal A, which is to allow the JavaScript list to change without an event when get user media succeeds, and then only fire the device change event when devices are added or removed by user action, <clears throat> or I guess OS action. You could argue uh, we can that could be a sub discussion. Uh, proposal B, uh, alternatively, we can only change, yeah, we can say that only changes to the JavaScript list cause device change to fire, meaning that if you call enumerate devices, you'll see a difference. That would actually mean not firing device change in a lot of cases where we fire today, uh, which is before you call get user media. The spec actually says to fire the event if the user inserts a device. Only Edge actually is spec compliant there, as far as I can tell. Chrome, Safari, and Firefox. Firefox has a bug open on it that we should be doing that. We've been hesitant to implement it until the whole privacy model has settled. <clears throat> but that is the only way to solve the use case of the user has no devices, and then suddenly they, they get a device. <clears throat> so the proposal B, you would only see that, <clears throat> excuse me, if you go from zero to one device. And then we would invent a new event called uh, device inserted or new device if one or more devices were were actually added by user action. <clears throat> There's no proposal for removing removal because that's not really interesting. There's no use case to detect that that I can think of. And that's it. Thoughts? Question, do we have any, um, have anyone complained about um, device change or uh, this, this use <laughs> It's, it's, we've already broken. So, um, so uh, we, we ship yeah. we ship the behavior of firing a device change event after first get user media uh, from the start. Uh, our fear was that since we were the only browser doing filtering before get user media and not after, uh, websites might not call always or be stuck with like oh there's only two devices or whatever. So we decided to fire the, the event uh, to be sure it, it was it was working. Um, I, I looked at a few websites in, in Safari 
and I can see that the, some of the websites show a UI when I plug a device, but they do not show that UI after get user media. So they are doing some filtering to work around that bug. So somehow they managed to handle it properly. Uh, we have not we have not received any feedback saying oh you should change it. We have not changed it. Um, I think that we could actually change it if we if all browsers are now doing the filtering, and we can see that we can stop firing the device change event without fearing of compatibility. Because um, well, I, I like proposal A because um, as as taking this device change or uh, filtering out to the device devices was uh, kind of our way of uh, deprecating calling enumerate devices before get user media, but without actually breaking things too much, so allowing allowing returning something without returning the true list. Um, but it was not um, a particularly supported use case, I think, to actually do this before and after, considering we don't want to expose this information before it. Uh, so if device, like if we do proposal A, then device change can continue to do what it was supposed to do from the start. And it's also um, deterministic, like you already have an event for the first time you need to call the enumerate devices because that's the, the promise being resolved. So you don't need a very similar API that does almost the same thing, I think. Uh, however, that would be uh, assuming we don't break things by doing proposal A. For proposal A, isn't get user media not the only way to actually get access to device labels? User can deny initially, right? And don't go to Omnibar and allow from there, which actually means that we should start exposing labels from the get go, right? Which is when it is a good moment for device change to fire for the application to understand that permission is there, device labels are available, right? A very explicit mechanism. Yeah. Another well, approach to proposal B a variant would be uh, just um, another attribute value to the device change event, saying, oh, it's a device change event, and actually there's a new device. But why aren't we concerned about device removals in this case, or device swaps, right, uh, at, at removal? So I, I'm not following exactly what, what, what's, well, why insertion is different. <laughs> Because the, the only uh, thorn, this used to work well before we started. Um, we're only, rem for privacy reasons, we're only removing knowledge of devices. So there are hidden devices. So the only problem is devices, when they become unhidden, it could look like devices were added. There's no, there's no problem the other way, where things start out known and then become hidden. So. Um, and you wouldn't actually, so device change event is already uh, quite, you can already tell when things are removed from device change 100%. Yeah, the, the ended event will tell you whether the device you're using is actually being removed. And then you can take an action. Sure, but even without it, that event, you can tell when the list uh, shrinks. And, and that can only shrink from removal, I believe, physical removal. Uh, but how would that work privacy. if I have a list of size one initially, regardless of the number of devices, and then mm -hmm. I remove my active device, right? List size is still one, right? Um, it would stay zero then, yeah? Well, say I have multiple devices, right? I have two devices, I remove mm -hmm. one. Without permission, I will, see, I will see one device, right? And, well, Third after removing change. one of two devices, I still will see one device. Wouldn't that's it? correct. Yeah, that's, that's a privacy. And that, that is also, we have the same issue if you add a device before GUM, because before GUM, you can't, if you don't have permission, we don't allow you to see multiple devices. And the spec currently says to the fire the device change event, even even if you insert a secondary device, but when you look at the list, uh, you're still going to see that you only have one device. So that's the same problem, uh, yeah. I think. I'm raising it because of the race condition you mentioned. I, I, it seems to me that it's the same kind of race condition you get here, right? If you do get user media and you unplug a device. Very similar issues, isn't it? <clears throat> well, so if we go into detail, I think the browsers would actually have to be careful if someone, if the user inserts a device right around the time that user media is called, they probably want to wait to to surface that until 
the, the JavaScript has had time to process the success of get user media, call enumerate devices, and then uh, fire the device change event, which they're allowed to do, but there's not a lot of help in the spec at the moment with that kind of stuff. We already allow to delay the device firing for fuzzing and other reasons. So browsers could solve that for users, which I, uh, for websites, which I think they should. If I'm not mistaken, if uh, before game, if you're inserting a device and you already have one, maybe we should not fire the device change event. Uh, yeah, that that we could we could. Uh, that's a good uh, idea as well. I, I thought about that, and uh, if the group wants to do that, we could. That would make sure, sense. Sure, yeah. So, can you reiterate for my notes this proposal C? Uh, it's it's a separate issue, which is that uh, when you already have one device, pre gum, and the user is plugging another device, there should be no device change event. Right. That would be more privacy sensitive, yeah. Uh, more privacy respecting. I think I think we are doing that in separate. What what if we suppress all device change event if you don't have permission? Well, if we do that, then there's then um, well, you could already pull so the problem is that the enumerate device list right now is not allowed to change without the event. So that proposal A would be allow it to change. So uh, right now, you can call enumerate devices, and you can tell whether you have 0 or 1 of a device. Right. So the use case there is that, uh, that I mentioned, a user does not have a camera, so you don't want to show them anything to do with camera as a feature. But then if they later insert a camera, the JavaScript would want to now show the, the user a camera feature so they can choose it. So it seems that uh, even without permission, right, it makes sense to expose information if it's zero devices or at least one device, right, of each type. And obviously, if there is a change from zero to at least one, then, well, this needs to be signaled as well, right? Right. Yeah. So I think you want to propose that to remove the device, the event only when there's like one and above. And I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does anyone like proposal B? No. 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 <laughs> Does that mean people like proposal A? Yeah. They like Mambook. I'm not sure about the second bullet, but maybe. I don't know what user action means. I don't know what OS action means. Meaning that it, well, we could we could also so, say that it should. Uh, we should not fire the device change. We can invert it and say, don't fire the device change event from um, when uh, removing privacy mitigations on the uh, enumerate devices list. So, don't, don't, don't fire it if the list is just because you got permission, not because. Right. Yeah. Yes. But how would application know then, then that, that you now have access to device labels and it can enumerate and present this information to the user? Uh, it could listen to get user media success, or it could pull enumerate devices. Yeah. Pull, um, but, mm, I see. J just a question. Uh, I think we have still quite a bit of uh, other issues to get to. So uh, right. what should we do here? What do you think, Harold? My personal, uh, um, per my personal opinion, proposal A is the is the minimum change. Proposal B will break existing code. So, should we take this to the list, or I will. I I, I would argue that we should pick pick proposal A. Oh, okay. And uh, be, and be done with it. Are there objections to that? Uh, I like it. I would first. I, I'm fine. I find if your PR is. Uh, Return. I'm fine reviewing it. Uh, I, okay. I, I will still prefer. I, I think Safari will keep its behavior until we are sure that we will not break it. Okay. So I think the next step is develop a PR along proposal A and have it reviewed. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Great. Yep. Thanks. All right, uh, Harold. Okay. So. 
what happens when you close when you close the lid of your machine? Well, it depends on the configuration machine. But uh, the reason this came up was that Chrome used to say if you suspend the machine, you close the pair connection. And this was used. It was never in spec. And in fact, we have tried to search through the, our knowledge of DOM and trying to find some event that corresponds to suspension, and we couldn't find it. So the editors on pay connection and concluded that no, there's no, there's no is, is here. We're, when, uh, when, when machine suspends, we should, we should just uh, let pay connections go on. If they time out before they wake up again, no time out happen. If you, if you don't, they don't time out, ha live happily ever after, after. But it did lead, lead us to consider what happens with devices. And the creepy say, state was you close the lid of your machine, you open it and uh, think that, oh, this machine is locked, nothing is happening, nothing awful is going to happen. And then you notice the camera light is on. That doesn't sound right somehow. So the suggestion that the editors that talk about this came up with was that when a machine gets suspended, we should fire muted at the pair connection, at the, at the tracks, not at the pair connection, at the tracks that are sourced from uh, live devices. And um, then when we then we when we wake up the machine again, we should not start sending media until the user has had a chance to interact with the machine, for instance by unlocking it. And then we should fire the unmute event. But what we still haven't sorted out is how do, how do we specify that when we don't have a DOM event to hang it off? Mm. So that's where we are. So the questions to the group are, is the suggestion reasonable? Um, is the su suggestion specifiable? Is that a word? Um, is the suggestion implementable? Uh, those are three questions. Uh, I think it makes sense. I think, well, I think it would be easy to, to specify something where you know what we're talking about, but we're talking about the technical details of implementing it and what OS event does this correspond to. Uh, I'd leave that to someone else. I'm, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think guidelines, we, we should at least have guidelines. If we can do something more precise, maybe, but mm. that might be difficult. Yeah, but so, I definitely agree that a locked device doing recording is creepy. I think it should definitely no. say not to do the creepy thing. And then if uh, so, uh, so I, I'm, I think we should just write up a PR for this. But uh, well, if we need to clarify it in the future, uh, then that's that's fine. So I have a couple of. Uh, concerns here, which is that I don't think the machine actually suspends in Chrome. So I don't think it's about suspension. I think if JavaScript is, is fully suspended or the, the OS is fully suspended, then there will be no time to fire muted or anything like that. I think what's happening. Right. So I actually opened a separate issue 670 that are sort of a, a, a similar issue to this. Um, so I think what, what Chrome did was actually when you close the lid of a laptop, it closed the peer connection. And you could still observe that the JavaScript was running. And in that case, I agree. And it does not fire the mute event. Um, so I, I don't think this is tied to suspension. I think it's tied to, and, and I'll, I'm also, you can configure your machine um, to, to not suspend in these cases when you close the lid. Mm, yeah. Um, but can it's still we, can not. We tie it to uh, you know logging off or something like that. 
Well, that's the other thing. You can lock your machine and also not suspend it, right? So, right, right. Um, so I, the I closest I could come up with was that, um, for just from observation, there is some decision point in audio playback that happens that when you close the lid, if, you, if you're playing YouTube or whatever, uh, audio playback will stop. So one idea I had was to piggyback on that, that basically if, uh, if audio and video output cease, input should also cease, and the mute should be fired in that case. Yes, is there a spec that says that it uh, stops playing? I don't know. I don't I haven't found one. Yeah. So we still have a unsolved problem in how to specify that. But, but it seems but, that we that, that everyone agrees that we shouldn't be creeping. Well, I, I think this is actually up to user agents to try to not be creepy. Yeah. Um, but they're already doing a good job with silencing uh, uh, audio output. Um, and maybe, uh, so I was hoping we could piggyback on that without specifying what that is. Mm. And sounds, sounds like implementation advice is easy to write. Mm. Yeah. So we should at least do that. And the other thing that's I noticed when I, I tested this uh, in both Chrome and Firefox that uh, when you open your laptop again, you get to a lock screen. Having the camera on in that case was extremely creepy because you're being recorded, but, but I may not remember if I was in a call or not. <laughs> so yeah. It, I, yeah, some kind of recommendation that uh, which uh, that unmute. But I mean, this is mute and unmute are totally up to the user agent already. So I, I don't know if we should just trust that they do. The I right think we, thing we should we should we should at least provide guidelines for muting. For unmute, unmuting is different, and unmuting should be left to the user agent. Yeah, good answer. Good. Okay, yeah, yeah. so uh, should we just say that this is resolved? With, uh, or the work group re recommends that uh, that we should write guidelines. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Okay, Henrik. All right. Um, so with user chooses, we introduced this, introduced this Chrome in Chrome picker. And uh, it's, in some cases, it might uh, compete with in-content pickers. And in some cases, it might not. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this. Um, and I, I mostly just want to get a feeling about where we are headed because I'm here. I, I've heard both that we should do something about this and that we shouldn't do this, something about this. And it seems to uh, interact with a lot of different issues. So what happens with the chooser chooses is if there are multiple devices left after constraints processing, you will be shown a, a picker by the browser UI where the user selects the device instead of uh, letting the user agent def decided the default for you. Uh, and then, but then if we have this uh, user chooses AI uh, UI, then uh, this makes me question the required constraints a bit. Because right now, um, you know, if you have two cameras uh, and one camera is facing me and the other uh, camera is facing my room, if the application says that it wants HD, um, then it's going to pick the wrong device. And the question is, if, if we have this picker, why not let the user pick? Uh, so I, I want to see, like, to what extent should filtering out devices be um, allowed? And perhaps more importantly is, to what extent do we want device IDs and labels to be exposed? Uh, and this, this might be a can of worms, because we have these device IDs that are used for in-content selection. Uh, or used to avoid reprompting when visiting the site, or used to uh, toggle between front and back cameras. Um, but in any case, it seems weird that uh, to if we have a, an API for uh, or a, a UI for choosing the camera, why would the camera uh, choice not be up to the user? So next slide. So the the, the main proposal is that uh, if you're using the user chooses uh, constraint, then you, know, you can still use device ID to filter out devices. But if you use any other constraints, then 
if, if using those constraints results in reducing the set of uh, devices, then you should ignore them. So for example, uh, you can force the HD setting on a device that supports both HD and, and uh, low resolution, but you may not exclude the device from the set of devices that may be selected. So even if you ask for HD, the user will still be able to choose the uh, low, low def device. Um, so there's, there's several flavors of this. Like the, the proposal in and of itself could be a standalone proposal, but because I want to get the, the, the sense of where are we heading, I, I want to go through different flavors. So in flavor A, we say that we still want to support um, uh, the application to implement the picker entirely. Uh, so in this case, if, if you give uh, uh, permission to any device, then you would, in enumerate devices, be able to get the list of all device IDs and labels. So the application could entirely implement the picker, which means you can, uh, you can bypass the prompt. But um, so in, in flavor B, we would allow not exposing the full list of devices. So you could have a, a minimal set of devices that you expose. Uh, this could be used, for example, to toggle between a front camera and a back camera. But you would uh, you could hide if other devices are available. So in, in this case, you could have a, a fake device ID uh, that just is a stand-in for uh, other devices, and then you could use that to to reprompt. And then the most aggressive flavor which, uh, seems far in the future, but is to always rely on the user chooses uh, picker. So basically the deprecate device IDs, and uh, then the, the only way to select the device is with the user chooses uh, approach. And if you want to avoid reprompting when you revisit the website, you would use a constraint like uh, previous device equals true, which says, give me whatever I used the last time I was on this domain. So, so where, where are we heading with devices and device IDs? Uh, are we intending that user chooses the new way of choosing devices? Yeah. In which case, we should do a, expose as little device IDs as possible? Or are we saying, no, we want things to basically work the same way as today, but if we do have the user chooses API, then we should at least not filter out device devices from the set of uh, configurations? Or should we not do anything? What's, what's so the feedback? Do? My feedback is that um, I think this presents a false choice. Mm -hmm. Because it sounds like you're saying, because we're going to have an, an in-browser picker, we should not support required constraints anymore. And I think that's those. I would love to keep these questions totally. I think they're orthogonal questions in that uh, should we still support required constraints? Yes or no? I think that's independent. I don't see why it matters whether the uh, picker that users see comes from the browser or the or the page. Well, that, I, that's I tail, tail wagging the dog to me. Well, I think the question, Avar, yeah, to... is whether uh, the uh, a sneaky application could somehow use that to basically get all the device information or not. How? Well, uh, by manipulating constraints to expose only some things and see what the user does, and then expose other stuff or you know things like that. You mean today? No, no. Today, it's not a, in the existing model. That's not a concern. Why not? But, you know, but basically. In, in the screen capture model, that's what we were afraid of, right? That the app could figure out what applications were running and do something devious to get the user to share their banking app or something. Right, that, that's my question is whether that is a concern here of similar things or not. Like we have to kind of decide what the security threat is. Is it just from learning all the device IDs or is there something else we're afraid of? Right, I, I think this is more a misunderstanding of what user chooses means. Uh, and that uh, user chooses does not mean we're going to go with a full get display media model. Because <clears throat> that would mean getting rid of all constraints, right? All right. device IDs. 
no one's okay. proposing that. So I think there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about what user chooses means. Uh, and that may be why user chooses is actually still not in the spec, even though we've discussed it in previous meeting, two meetings already. So, and part of the reason is that we're having difficulty getting agreement among uh, editors about merging it is actually because it raises all these uh, uh, long-term questions. So from, from speaking for Mozilla, we've already had a picker for, for years, right? And that picker is showing the user choices within the constraints of the application. So I think there's a, a, uh, I think it's a straw man or false choice a bit to say that uh, once you have a picker, we should empower the user to make full choices. Uh, we can so do that, but we could have already done that by not having required constraints. So these no, are false choices me, that we don't need to tie together. Uh, let me clarify. We don't we don't need to abandon the uh, the required <laughs> constraints. My understanding is with user ch user chooses is that it's it's used when when you need a, a tiebreaker, right? Right. There are multiple options. So instead mm -hmm. of doing the default, we, we ask the user. Uh, so we can leave it at, at that, which is fine, but this is where I, I want to know where are we heading? Because if we do have this way, this picker, and it does seem to solve a lot of um, things that are currently solved by the application, it seems to serve to some extent the same purposes, but the old way of doing things which we could continue to support, but the old way of doing things does seem to have this privacy concerns. So it would be good to know, do we want to, in the future, continue down that path, or do we want to try to step-by-step step limit the number of devices and more rely on user chooses? But, but um, why do we need to decide that now? We don't need to decide that. I, I just want... To, a feeling because because uh, every time there's an issue that talks about device ID, this uh, question is pops up into my mind where I wonder. Yeah. What's the plan? I, I mean, I it's your it's like here. Yeah. Uh, as, as in Eric, uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, our UI designers uh, would allow uh, a picker that would show entries or not entries based on what the web application is providing as input. Um, but that might be something that we will not get agreement to implement. So that's why it's an important question. So in your concern, UN, is uh, the, I just want to get clear on a threat model. The reason you wouldn't do that is because you're afraid of the app manipulating the list to learn stuff? Uh, it, it's, it's not really that. It's um, the, the user. It, it it might be very confusing for 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 the user if uh, th there's a picker and uh, he sees just one camera while there are at least three cameras in his setup that he can right, see right, right, in, right. In, in other places okay. or in other applications or in other websites. Uh, but it's it's an in Chrome uh, UI, so it should be consistent between websites. And right. the required constraints poses an issue there. So you're saying essentially that the the existing screen capture kind of a uh, concept really it makes more sense to you. Uh, we, you you show all the win you have to yeah. show all the windows, right? The, the app can't can't restrict it. Yeah, it's we're much more comfortable with that approach. Yes. Right. Okay. That, but um, someone should propose that then. Because right now, I think it sounds like we're saying there's no path to incrementing toward this. Um, and that, that means it's difficult then to make progress. Yeah. Um, it is a pretty uh, fun, fundamental question because it's, I think, a bigger change to media capture, you know, if we go so, down that whole road. So the, the goal of user choose is just to recap. And it's a good point to do that. It was, was not to. Um, become the the future of all pickers, but to uh, remove in content device selection with a minimum amount of uh, disturbance needed, so that um, well, uh, so that job, empowering thought, JavaScript to invoke uh, a Chrome picker. I thought that I thought that, uh, the, the agreement on user chooses was that uh, we we would provide a method that 
applications could choose to use without breaking the current method until it's proven that uh, applications can use this new method. So, uh, and to my mind, the changing the require the, the behavior of required constraints is uh, in when you're not use, doing user chooses. It's definitely off the table. But and if you are doing right. user chooses, and if you are using the user, well, let's let's get user chooses coded and see if it see how it works. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's too early to, to try to to take away power uh, at this time. Right. And also, I don't think JavaScript applications would switch to an API that where they didn't where they had less control. So that's the other issue, I guess. Although, right. I mean, if, if that's if an the browser, yeah. Um, oh. Would it help to say that uh, user agents may ignore required constraints uh, if user chooses? Is that something? Look, what are you thinking about writing for as a PR here? Um. I, I would probably say that not to reduce the set of devices if I wrote this PR, but I'm happy to merge the original PR first and then you know see where this leads us. Um, the The main reason for me presenting these slides is because I want I want to know where we're headed because this ties into to everything we're discussing all the time like, And and it does. We do need to know uh, if we do implement the the picker. We do need to know whether we should filter the the list of uh, options to the user or not. So I don't know how we could implement user chooses without <clears throat> saying either that you yes we do want to to filter the set of devices which we kind of do today, or no we don't want to do that. So the I think of the op the options I like the least is to change too much based on user chooses because um, uh, then we then we fall then browsers would uh, we fall victim to the that web developers usually only test with one browser so um, it can actually be hard to operate in that world for other browsers um, so if there's um, um, yeah I, I, yeah I think we should take this uh, so I, got so too complicated. I, <laughs> I, I have a question. We're almost out of time, right. but um, I'm wondering how we can make more progress on user chooses. Is this something we should, I mean, I could see almost devoting uh, substantially more time in a future meeting to this to try to, I mean, what do we do to, to make more progress? It seems uh, like we're a bit stuck. I, I, still, I think I still owe um, a user experiment. Okay. And that's been more difficult to get. Uh, through in a timely manner uh, in the current situation. Um, help from UX folks and stuff. OK. Um, UN, would you be willing to, uh, do you have, are you looking at it similarly, some kind of experiment or? Uh, anyway, yeah, I think that, OK, so that's the, that's the next step is, a, is an experiment. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to apologize for not being able to, to get to the rest of this. I guess uh, we'll try to schedule another interim to get through the rest of the slides. Um, but I do think we accomplished something today. Yeah. We have a few so, things that we can merge or stop. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye, folks.